Our speaker today is Dr. Rafil Irizarry. Dr. Irizarry is chair of the Department of Data Science at Dana Farber, and he's also professor of biostatistics at Harvard. Over the past 20 years or so, he's made essential contributions to our understanding of the interpretation of RNA seq of gene expression experiments on a genome wide level and other high throughput experiments. <laughs> Among his other work is un estimating the number of deaths from natural disasters such as Hurricane Maria and the COVID-19 epidemic. He's also educated thousands in, through online courses. Today, he's going to talk about some of his work on single cell RNA-seq. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation. Okay. All right, great, thanks. So thanks again for the invitation. I'm gonna talk, talk today about some of my most recent research, but uh, with first with an introduction about the way I work and, and some of the uh, previous motivating data sets and challenges that has made us uh, work in, in the way that we work. So this is, uh, you can see there my Twitter handle, that's where we put up a lot of our research updates and also my webpage where you can get links to papers and books and other and courses that were mentioned as well. So this is an outline. I'll start with a little, little bit of uh, explanation of how important I think extra, exploratory data analysis is and how we use it in, in genomics research. Then introduce single cell and ASIC. I, I probably will skip that part because I think the audience here knows what that is by now. Uh, then I'll, I'll describe in chronological order or historical order uh, some of our findings of the past three years, uh, starting with the discovery of some of the biases and, cha and statistical challenges in, in these data and ending with what we're doing now with spatial transcriptomics. So I'll start with a little bit of, of, um, of an introduction of, as I said, the way we work. So one of the things that I, uh, that, that I encounter in, as a collaborator is that our uh, collaborators working with these new high throughput technologies, they are very prone to use workflows uh, as they appear in, in uh, described in journals. This is a screenshot of what you get when you Google image workflows in, in, the, in the nature journals. They're all over the place. And basically what they all are saying, if you want, if you want to be uh, reduce it to a very simple flow chart, it's basically telling you that they do this processing of data and at the end you discover something. So they give you the recipes for how to do this. But what we, um, we have encountered several times in, in my career, in my lab, in, in, as they work with me, is that often some of these steps aren't appropriate and we want, and, and, and then the whole thing breaks apart. But the tools will still give you a, an answer at the end and it doesn't necessarily uh, show you diagnostic plots or, or, or other exploratory plots to, to let you know if, if it's appropriate to use or not. So what you end up doing is you might end up just having false discoveries and really not knowing what. This is of course the end, the end users, not, not the methods developers. So one of the things I tell my students and my collaborators is that when you've based on all this experience of over 20 years of working with these kinds of uh, workflows, that if you find an unexpected result, be skeptical and check for systematic errors. And that data exploration and visualization must be part of every workflow. So just don't, just, just don't run uh, these tools as, as, as they are, as they come from, from the box. Always look at the data. So one of the things that we, we do is we, we, we develop statistical methods and develop pa software packages, mostly in R and Bioconductor that permit you to do that. And often when we find a problem for, for new data sets or new types of data sets, then we, we, we improve the existing pipelines. All right, so I'm gonna start with a, with a very simple in, in hindsight example uh, to motivate this, this idea of, of how important exploratory data analysis is. And then I'll move on to some of our recent work in single cell RNA seq Let me look at the clock. All right. So here, I'm gonna use this example. I've used it 
many times, and I use it in, in our courses as well, it, it, because not to, to call out this particular paper, but because it, it really is a very good illustration of what I'm describing. So this is a this is from a paper, this conclusion here. Uh, this quantitative phenotype differs significantly between European derived and Asian derived populations for a quarter of the genes tested is a very surprising result. They looked at blood, they had blood samples from two ethnic groups and they compared gene expression between the two groups and found that about a quarter of the genes were differentially expressed. That's a very surprising result. Um, and, but when you look at the paper, everything was done correctly. They follow the workflows that were the appropriate workflows at the time. Uh, they, 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 in this case, it was t-test because they were in a big, big enough sample size followed by well, Ferroni correction. So it was actually perhaps overly, overly uh, conservative in, in declaring something significantly different. Now, so when, you, when we see a result like that, we, we go, that is this surprising? We want to look at the data uh, as close as the raw data as possible. So here is the, here's the data for one of the genes that had one of the smallest, or I think maybe the, the smallest p-value of all. This is using microarrays. This is an old example. This is using microarrays and, and, and um, so they're testing, I think around 20,000 genes. The 4,000 is because they filter a bunch out. Uh, but anyways, here's the top gene and you can see that that's definitely is gonna have a p-value that's small if you just do a t-test. So you have the two groups, there's data, you can, can you know, just by eye, you can tell it's gonna be significant. But there's another thing we see by eye here that isn't, that you don't see when you just look at the p-value. And it's that you have a, um, in the red group, there seems to be more than one grouping there. If you, if you look closely, there seems to be maybe two or three. It doesn't, it definitely doesn't look like it's just a normal distribution. The blue looks a little bit more like that. So if you look at the date now, one, a next step, this is a little bit more difficult to figure out that you should do this, but by now we have enough experience to know to do this. If you plot the data, this is the same data for the same gene, but now we're plotting it in the order that the samples were, were given to us. Or actually it's just alphabetical, I think, this from, from the file names. And what you see, now you see something that definitely makes you think there's maybe a problem. If you look closely at the red, it, it's, it drops all of a sudden around, at around uh, the 80th or 90th sample, it just drops and then it looks like the others. And when you start looking at other genes that are at the top of the list of, if you rank by p-values, there's another one. You see the same thing. There's the, the red is, is up at, at uh, 7.75 and it drops to about seven. And then the blue also is at seven. Here's the third gene. So you have three genes in a row that have this problem, that have this issue. And actually you can keep, um, oh, sorry, okay. I got stuck. I don't know what happened. My computer's stuck. Oh, there it goes. <laughs> okay. All right, I don't know what that was. All right, okay, one, two, three. All right, so now what, what we're gonna see in the next step is I'm gonna take the same plot and I'm gonna change the colors to represent, instead of ethnic group, the outcome of interest here, I'm gonna represent the day, the year in which the data was processed. This is a data set that was collected through, through several years. And now once we do that, then we immediately see what the problem is. And it looks like whatever protocols were developed um, in 2002, 2003 were changed. And, uh, and then it, it, it had an effect on, on the measurement. So you see that in 2004, things change. And unfortunately in this particular case, the outcome of interest is confounded with year, almost, almost perfectly. So when you, when you just look at, if you, this is the same uh, pipeline applied not to ethnicity, but to year. So here we're comparing 2000 and before 2004 and after for the same group, for the same, not, 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 for, not for the two, but for just one group. And we find that there's 
uh, again, a bunch, many, a large percentage, above 20% of genes are, st are statistically significant when you compare just when it was processed. So another conclusion here is that it was actually, and this is from a, from this paper that actually published that this result that it, it was it was there was this confounding issue. So the possible explanation for the pervasive signature of differential expression observed is a systematic bias introduced during sample preparation or microarray expression measurements. So that is so th uh, this is an example of seeing an unexpected result, looking at the data, and then finding an alternative explanation for why. That is, and now, if you're gonna, th this pipeline needs to get changed so that it can accommodate these kinds of what we call now batch effects. Now, in in uh, single cell RNA seq, we're seeing many many papers publishing um, unexpected results, and here are these are just ra uh, almost a random sample of papers that are out there uh, that many of them claiming that they have discovered new cell types. And often the way this is done is by putting the data through a clustering algorithm, finding clusters, as you can see in these uh, artistic renditions using TISNI of the of the of two dimensions that have been transformed in a certain way to, to, so that the data looks separated. And you can see that, the, that there's all these clusters. These, these are, again, often the driving analyses that takes us to, to claim that there's a new cell type that we have never seen before. So you, you put in a bunch of cells into a, an, uh, to, through this through this uh, process and each one has a gene expression profiles. So you can do clustering and then you, you, you show them, you display them using TISNI. That's a very common approach in, in single cell. So I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna go back now to the raw data and show you why I think that the process that was used to, to get to some of these type these types of pictures can be improved. So I'll go back to the first data, the first single cell RNA seq data set that we saw. This was around 2016, 17. And this was a somewhat unexpected result, not completely unexpected, really, but it is interesting. And what th this paper was saying is that if you take five different tumors from five different individuals and you, you, you extract cells from the tumor, cancer cells, and you, you run single cell RNA-seq, they cluster by, by individual, even though it's the same cancer type. And, and here's a, this is not a TISNI plot, this is just a PCA plot uh, of the data. And you can see that in fact, it is, it is, um, it is in fact separating out by, by the individual, as you can see by the colors being separated. But the, the thing we noticed in this case is that the sequencer in which it was run uh, also separated almost perfectly. And it was almost completely confounded so that the, each individual was run on a different um, sequence, sequencing run, which is, I think it's hard to avoid in these experiments, but there was one, there was one case and it's the, the, one, of the, one of these tumors actually had two runs. And that one, is, here it is, it's tumor five. That one split up perfectly by, uh, by batch. That's a problem, we don't want that. So now we wonder, is that really a biologically driven result or is it a, it's a, a artifact is the question. So let's see. So we started exploring, and one of the things that we, we hit upon that seemed problematic was first of all, that the, the variability in the proportion of genes that weren't zero. So you take each cell, which produces a vector of numbers, one expression for each gene. If you just compute the proportion of, of genes that aren't zero, that proportion is, it varies quite a bit. So here's six, five different experiments. This is public data. One of the experiments, we have two sets of data, two groups. And you can see, first of all, if you look at the x-axis, that's the that's proportion of genes that aren't zero. It, it goes all the way from zero to, uh, what's the highest, 60%. So there's a big, big range. That's, that's actually pretty surprising too. And then the other thing that we noticed, and this isn't really that surprising, is that it is the first principal component. 
it's almost, in some cases, almost exactly the first principal component is driven by that proportion. So that could be a problem if that is actually, if that proportion, if that proportion of zeros is an experimental artifact as opposed to a biological reality. That, I don't know, which is, if it, which we can't really say from the data which it is, but it's that is a statement that can't, that you can't deny. It's either, it, either way, it's driven by this. That's just clearly clear from the data. So one thing that we saw that made us think maybe an ex, it is an experimental artifact is that, or it could be both actually, uh, is that you have, this is the one, this is a, the one case that comes from the same tumor in two different batches. And there, this is on the, this is box plots of that proportion that aren't zero. And you can see that there's a big difference by, by experimental run. And you can also then see that that, this isn't surprising anymore because it is the first principal component that it, it does change from batch to batch, which means it changes from individual to individual, the proportion of genes that aren't zero. So that, that observation, we, we did it for many, many different experiments and, and we showed that it was consistently the case. It's published in this biostatistics paper if you wanna learn more about that one. So that was, so for those that are in this field, there, there's, there was a change in technology after this paper, right around when this paper was published, uh, where they had slightly better data. So it was, it was SmartSeq, that's what it was. What the date was the technology was used in, and they, they found they found a way to, to improve it by using something called unique molecular identifiers, which help which helps you avoid the effect of PCR multi, um, multiplying out and 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 taking and having diff, the same starting uh, molecules to end up in very different numbers because the PCR reaction worked different. So you could go from having one molecule convert turns into a hundred. In another case, you might have two molecules that turn into 50. So to, the UMI lets you get back to that one or two and, and, and be able to actually count molecules. It's very, very great, big improvement. But that improvement actually made this observation even stronger. It, it made it even clearer that the, the percent of zeros was really driving the, the variability. So here, this is now a this is now a, an experiment using the UMIs. And now we actually, uh, in between the first and the second paper, we changed from percent of non-zeros to percent of zeros. So now, now I'm, I'm saying the fraction of zeros. Uh, so here you can see that the fraction, as before, the fraction of zeros changes dramatically from, in this case, all the way from 80 to 100, 80% 80 zeros to 100% zeros. And then that's almost perfectly correlated with the first PC. This is an experiment where uh, we have, we, it's, it's a um, negative control experiment where we should have all these cells being the same. So now this is really looking like it is an experimental bias. So if you apply TISNI, which is this, um, this, trans, this, this, this transformation you can apply to the data so that when you, uh, when you plot the dimensions that come out of it, it, it separates out uh, things that are that could be different in some way, like if you have uh, if you have two things that might um, might not separate in the regular uh, continuous plane, but it's somehow maybe it's on a circle or, or on a curve, then this can actually find that uh, find that curve that separates groups into into two distinct groups. So if you apply this technology this 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 method to this these data, which again, these are, this is, this is a, a completely uh, negative control. It's actually not even real cells. They just spiked in the RNA. Uh, you can see that TISNI finds clusters. You can see those little, those little uh, clusters just like all over the place. Um, so that's making us worry even more that some of these results might be driven by this. And here's another, this is another negative control experiment, but instead of being in a completely fake one, this is using uh, real cells, but they were carefully selected to all be the same cell type. So here you can, you you can see that there's, this is again applying TISNI that you do see this separation. And now I'm using the color to show you the fraction of zeros in each one of the cells. And you can see that it's, it's clearly driving 
the, the, the separation. So these, these cells out here are cells that have uh, uh, less zeros than these cells out down here that have more zeros. All right, so let's, so now the next, the next thing we wanna do, so of course we point this problem out. Now we wanna perhaps, we wanna come up with a solution of coming up with a, in, in the, first ta the first challenge we tried to attack was to try to come up with a dimension reduction algorithm that wasn't prone to being affected by this proportion of zero. So, so we're, the way we're thinking is, let's suppose that the, the, the percentage of zeros that one sees is, I'm not saying necessarily it's a, lab, it's a lab artifact, but let's suppose that we don't want that to be driving the variation. We want to. We want to. That's easy to compute. You compute the percent of zeros, and if that's what you think is important, you look at that. But let's let's see what is left over after you account for that. So you can separate it out. There's just the part that's driven by the zeros, and then there's the rest. So that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to come up with with an algorithm that that, that wasn't driven by that, by just by a, a, a dimension reduction algorithm that wasn't driven by that. Now, why are we doing dimension reduction? The answer really to that, like. Right now, I don't even know if we, if we even need to do dimension reduction if what we want to do is cluster things. But because everybody was first doing dimension reduction first to then find clusters or then make plots or then do other things, um, you know, we thought let's, let's develop what the users and, and collaborators are currently uh, asking for. Okay, so let's look at the data now. We're, this is a... I was somewhat surprised that it seemed like a, a lot of the the, 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 the method developers weren't weren't even making simple plots to notice what seemed to be obvious in hindsight. But well, here it goes anyway. So so let's look at the data. So if you if many of the methods that were out there uh, for for including for dimension reduction that were somewhat more, more advanced, one of the things they were doing that was uh, different from what we've seen before is that they were including zero, inf they were using zero inflation models to account for the fact that you had so many zeros. And when you look at the data for say one gene, you can see why they would be doing that. So here is the, uh, the data for one gene. This is real data. None of this is, by the way, I forgot to mention this. None of the, none of the figures I show are simulated or, or cartoons. They're all plots based on actual data. So, so this is a one gene from one of those experiments we just showed you. And this is a histogram of the, the gene expression for that gene, but it's already transformed in the way that we use these data. So they, and I'll get into that in a second, they, they, they divide by a million, add one and take the log. I'm gonna explain why later, but here's a plot. So you have the zero, a bunch of zeros, the most, majority zero, and then you have on, on the right, oh, sorry you have some, the non-zeros and those also seem to have like two modes. Right? So maybe there's three things there, three clusters that this gene distinguishes. All right, now how do we get to that? So for, for um, RNA-seq, for bulk RNA-seq, there was, this was a common transformation to apply because there was, um, the counts were pretty large they were, the variance increased with the mean, so people wanted to take the log, but sometimes there were zero, not that, not that often, sometimes there were zero, so they added one to be able to take the log. That was just the transformation that was not done in RNA-seq. That just gets adopted by single cell RNA-seq, uh, uh, people working on that single cell RNA-seq, they just adopt the same thing, divide by the total, to normalize for the, for the fact that different cells end up giving you different total number of, of counts, the coverage sometimes it's called. And you multiply by, by a million to get it in, in a uh, range where it's interpretable. And then to avoid zero, to avoid logging zeros, you add one. That's the normalization that, that, was, that was common. So let's see what that normalization does to to the data. So now, before I was showing you the transformed data, now I'm showing you the actual raw counts for one gene across many, many cells. This is the data. That is not zero inflated. That's just looks like a Poisson. I bet you a Poisson fits 
this perfectly. Like a Poisson would like mean four or five or, or, or six, four, four or five. But what happens when you um, divide by the, the coverage and multiply by 10 to the six, now you get this. So what's happening? So you go from here to here. Why? Because you're dividing by the total count for each cell, which itself is varying a lot. We already saw that the percent of zeros, actually, I didn't make that connection, but the percent of zeros is, is driven by the fact that you have different it's sampling at, uh, of molecules. It's a mul in statistics, we, we call this a multinomial. Um, you have a bunch of genes or a bunch of balls of different colors and you pick out some um, and try to estimate the proportions of each color in the bag. If you take out five, you'll have a lot of zeros for the different colors. If you take out a thousand, you will have almost no zeros or no zeros for the different colors represented in the back. So here is what happens when you take that, when you divide by that, how much you take out. So you introduce variability, you introduce these different, um, uh, what appear to be different clusters. But then to make it even worse, now you're gonna add one and take the log. And that induces this uh, distribution. So that zero inflation is completely driven by, in this case, completely driven by the transformation. It's not the data. So our idea was not to apply that transformation and model the data directly. So before I continue that, this is gene, this gene that I show you, that's actually a very highly expressed gene for, for single cell on AC. A more common gene would have we have a distribution like this, where you just have mostly zeros, some ones, some twos, very few threes, and that's it. That, that's a, a much more common uh, gene distribution in single cell RNA-seq. The data is very, very sparse. So, so you're going from that data, that's the data. The data is, is 1,000 zeros, 100 ones, 15 twos, and eight threes. That's the data. And you're converting that very simple Poisson looking count data into, into this, into this on the right, which is really doesn't make sense, right? So of course, if you do that, then you're gonna get all sorts of different, um, in, 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 all, these, all these variability that you, you don't even need to introduce. So uh, that to, 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 to systematically show that, that the data can actually just be modeled as a, a multinomial or a Poisson. Multinomial is approximately Poisson when you have large ends. Uh, we, we actually fit the, the we, we, we predict how many zeros should you see based on the mean of the, of the count. So you take each cell, you compute the mean, and then you, you assume a multinomial, you can predict how many zeros you should see, based on, on the mean, which is you can estimate from the data. So here's, here's the, 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 the little circles are as actual data that you get from, a, from, the, from the negative control experiment. And you can see it, it's perfectly predicted. You don't, need, you don't need to have any kind of zero inflation, anything. And then for that, this is for a completely negative control exp experiments. Once you add an experiment that has biological variability, then you, it still fits pretty well, but there's a little extra variability this is basically coming from biological variability, but you can you don't need zero inflation or anything. You just need to account for that extra variability with, for example, a negative binomial, or you could also use a quasi Poisson. That's what that little red, those little red dots show you that that fits the data slightly better than, than the Poisson. Long story short, a simple Poisson model works quite well for these data. You don't have to do anything fancy like a zero inflation model. So now for, for, for the piece, for the finding the uh, principal components problem, well, now the, the, the thing, the, the very pretty simple thing we did was just fit a fit PCA, fit the PCA model, but in a general linear model um, context. So you assume that the counts are Poisson or negative binomial if you, if you want to do it that way. And then you then then once you assume their Poisson, you you then model the log of the expected value just like in a GLM, with a so here I'm here so I'm this, so then this is the PCA model you have factors and loadings like the U and the, that's what the U and the V are, 
That's what PCA, that's what you do in PCA. But importantly, we have an offset for the total number of counts that you observe. So that's the sample, that's the sample size, that's the the multi the in the multi multinomial model, how many balls you take out of the bag. And that's how we're going to account for the, the proportion of zeros. That that offset is going to do it. So now this is this you, you can you can you can maximize this. Um, there's different approaches to doing this. It, it's not as simple as just the GLM, but it can be done. Um, it's not not complicated at all. And now you now we can we can apply it to the data and notice that we are in fact getting rid of the relationship between the first PC and the um, and the proportion of zero. So on the left is the original, just PCA. You can see the relationship. And on the right is the, G, we call it GLM PCA. On the right is, is GLM PCA. And you can see that the relationship between the first dimension and the zero fraction is, is no longer there. Here's a Disney plot applied to the PCs, the first few PCs of the GLM PCA. And you can see that the little clusters are gone. And the same for this other example, that little that batch out, that this batch of, of cells out here is, is, is also not separated anymore. Well, you, you still see it a little bit here, but not, not as strong as here. There's a lot more mixing between the red and the blue in this picture. All right, so getting back to that first, first uh, example I gave you, this is this was all being negative controls, but what about in like a real experiment? So now I'm what I'm showing you is. And th there's a little bit more to this story, which I'm going to skip um, because the count model doesn't work for SmartSeq because it's not counts. But uh, there's we have a we have an approach for dealing with it. I'm going to skip that part just to get to the other uh, sections. But what we show here, the main thing we're showing here is that if you use PCA on that data, this is the same plot I showed you earlier. The colors changed, but same plot. You have the different tumors separating out, but then unfortunately you have the gold and the red separating it out. And that's the same um, tumor. You can see it here, A, but in two batches, A and B. When we do, when we do GLM PCA, they're no longer separated. The gold and the red are all together. But even better, this has made the biologist happy. The separation of the tumors actually gets bigger. So it, it, it wasn't, their, their result was actually correct. And, and, and if they had used our approach, of course, they didn't, they didn't exist back then, they would, have even, they would have gotten an even cleaner uh, finding. So that, I, I like saying that because often people complain that, that all we do is, is like show that people made mistakes, but sometimes we can, we can help them make the signal come out even clearer. That's actually what we are actually strive for. So if you want to read more about these, um, the first paper there explains this GLM PCA idea. And then the second one is, is this, this, this uh, approach we use to be able to apply it to SmartSeq data. All right, so now next, now I'm going to talk about two more recent projects in the last 15 minutes. The first one is, is cell classification. So now we're uh, working with people that want, they give a single cell on ACK data, we want to be able to know uh, each cell, what cell type it is. So the current approaches we think can be improved. And in particular, we think that the, the approaches that are based on, um, on clustering can be improved quite a bit if you use a supervised approach. So the idea of a supervised approach is that you get some cells where you know what they are. It's either by sorting or some other approach. You train a model and then going forward, you predict using that. Now that, that might have a, you might think that has a limitation that it won't discover new cell types, but that actually can be, uh, can be added. You can, I, I won't get to explain how we do that, but you can actually also not classify cells, but also point and also has an output of the algorithm point out that some of the cells didn't classify in any group and they might be a new cell type. So he, here's the, the problem we see with some of with the approaches based on clustering and we're, we're showing the best clustering. The, 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 the Surat package has some of the best clustering 
uh, approaches that we found. Um, so this is actually using the best tools that we get that we see this problem. Uh, here, this is an example where we're, we are, we're convinced that there's only four cell types because of the way the experiment was run. So we're, we're pretty sure that there's four cell types here. If you run the, uh, the, 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 the best clustering algorithms out there, you, get, you often get more than four. And a particularly problematic observation we've made is that the more cells you include in the, in the, uh, the more cells you feed to the algorithm, the more clusters it finds. Even, so no, we know there's four, that's what we think, we're pretty sure is the correct answer. But as we add more cells at random, here we're just sampling at random, we start, you see how it starts increasing. Uh, the, so, and the other problem we see with these algorithms is that once you're done with the clustering, you still have to assign each cell type, each cluster to a cell type. And that's often done with known markers. And what we've found is that the known markers don't always work very well. And it's in part due to the sparsity that we've already talked about. So here's some data showing that. So this is for the cell, for cell type, for um, blood cell types. You can see on the names at the bottom and natural killer, CD14, CD8, CD4. And then on the call, on the rows, we have different marker genes that are used by these uh, packages to classify blood cell types. And you see that, uh, so we have, you can see the, the, the red lines are dividing the, the markers for the different cell types. So if, this, if these cell types were perfect, what you would see here is blue rectangles in the diagonal. And you can kind of see it, but it's not, it's not perfect. So these two are, are almost perfect marker genes. These two, right? Because they're only, well, they're not only blue and in, in natural killers, but you know, if you combine these two, you'll, you'll probably get those classified correctly. But once we go to CD8s and CD4s, we see that a lot of the marker genes, they are bluer than in the other ones, but not by that much. And we, we think that's just because of, of the sparsity. They, they're just, there's a higher probability of seeing the gene, but, but it's not 100% it's not probability. So our, that's the same result, just summarized differently. So what the idea that, that we're trying to implement is to take advantage of the fact that there's, there's probably other marker genes that haven't really been discovered yet or haven't been associated with different cell types. And when we, when we make plots like this, this is plotting the CD4. Uh, so let me explain what this one is. This is not as simple as, I, I often forget this is a little bit uh, more complicated than just a scatter plot. So the problem with finding marker genes is that you can't, if you just plot single cell data, it's because it's mostly zeros. You just get like a bunch of points at zero, zero, and then you know a couple of ones, twos uh, scattered around. So it's not really great for data exploration. But what we can do is we can take all the CD4s. So in this case, we had hundreds, perhaps thousands. And we average, we take the sum of all those to create like a, a pseudo bulk CD4 um, gene expression uh, data set. So you take all these, you add them up, and now, now you have counts for, for most genes. And then you do the same for, in this case, natural killer cells. You have, you take all the natural killers, you add them up, and now you have, now you have numbers that aren't zero. So what this is showing you is, are the rates. So we're showing rates divide by the, by the number of cells you're, you're, average, you're summing up. And now you actually get data, you get to see it. So the blue points, on the left, those are the supposed marker genes for CD4s. And you can see that these two are really good. Those, are, those, are, those definitely distinguish CD4 from NK because they're high rates for CD4 and zero. I mean, th these are zero. I just, we just added a constant to make it, to, to show the log. Uh, but, and there's zero in the other one. That's, that's what we want. But that's just two. These other ones aren't that great. These two are okay, they're higher. By, by quite a bit, but this one is, this one's no good. We might as well not use that one. But the other thing we see in this slide is there's, there's all these other ones you could use. Why don't we use those? Maybe they, you know, maybe we can maybe find that they're consistently can do a good job at distinguishing these two. 
And I, I apologize, I incorrectly inserted the wrong plot here, and so it's the same. <laughs> but I, what I had here was another example of two other cell types. So the idea that we're, that now what we have to do is we have to model uh, the, once you know which genes are, are, well, that was bulk. Now we have to come back to the single cell because that's where we want to make the prediction. So what we're, what we're trying to do now there is to mo have models that explain, that, that describe the probabilities of seeing each one of these things because it's not, it's not going to be uh, obvious enough that we can just like take differences and, and whatnot. We actually have to have probabilistic models. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with models that, that describe the distribution of genes that are off, we call off genes, distributions of genes that are on. The, the data is, is not, the, the single to noise ratio in these data aren't great. So you, you have a lot of overlap in the distributions of expressed and unexpressed genes. So you, you, we have this model that now can, can, can account for this for these for these probabilities. So what you have now is, and I'm still showing results for bulk, but here are genes that are, I'm showing you genes in each row and histograms for the rates that we see after creating these bulk uh, gene, these bulk samples, pseudo bulk samples for a bunch of different cell types. So one of the things we see is that we have these genes that are always off, we have genes that are always on, but then we have, then we have genes that are, and there's actually quite a few genes where you can see both uh, things. But what we do is with the, with the ones that are always off, we construct a model that tells us how, what, what distribution one, what's the distribution of the, of the centers of the off distribution for each gene and the same for the on distribution of each gene. And then once we do that, we, can, we have a way to decide to, to assign a probability to a to each gene on each tissue for it being on or off. And, and what I'm doing in this plot is showing you that the CD4 marker genes, uh, what are the probability of their being on? It's it it's some of them are very good. This one's good. This one has a probability of one. This one's good, this one's good, but there's two of them that aren't great. Those ones are are kind of they're not, they're not, maybe it's something about how it's sampled or how it, 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 it the, the technology can detect it, but it, does, it, it doesn't look like it's on as often as, as one would hope. But we can find a bunch of new ones now that are, that seem to always be on in CD4s. And using the probability models, we can say what the probabilities are. So what we can do now is we can take, we, we can define for each cell type, we can define for each gene, the probabilities of, of it being on and off. And then we can compute for, if once we have that set, then we can come in and, and say for a new cell that we don't know what it is to, 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 to compute the likelihood for each uh, cell type or the posterior probability for each cell type and then make a prediction that way. So when we, we do it, we're doing that now, this is a paper we're, we're working on the, on, the, on the second version now after we got very, Good reviews, and what we find is that when we when we use this to predict, we do very well. So there are approaches on the first row, and one of the distinguish one of the things we're we're doing here is we're um, we are comparing when when we run these these uh, ex these uh, assessment experiments, we um, we. Uh, we try to come up with a realistic assessment. So what we do is we train on one data set and then apply it to a completely different data set that was run in a different lab, different study, different paper. So, so we have the, you know, a, a, realistic, a, re, a realistic in the wild uh, data set. Uh, not, so what I'm saying is that we're not doing cross-validation within one data set. We're actually have a completely separate uh, sample and then the, the 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 other distinction that you see here similar coverage and different coverage these are cases where the training set is has has diff similar total number of counts per cell and these are cases where they're different 
So he, so that we, the reason we do that is because based on on our previous knowledge of of how much the the zero percent affects your variability, that we thought that this was going to be a harder, more challenging um, uh, set of of assessments. So uh, what we see here is that. Uh, this is the training set, so we don't even have to look at that column. But we see that they all we all do pretty well there. But once you come to this to the different coverage, then then other methods start to fail, and that's because I think they're being confused by the different coverage which we account for in the in the probabilistic models. All right. So if you want to read more about this, it, it is on BioArchive. Hopefully, it gets published soon. Uh, and you know, there's the reference. All right. So I was gonna I was gonna just give you a, I was, I, I was planning on stopping here, but I still have a couple of minutes. So I'll tell you a little bit about our transcriptional, uh, our work with transcriptional uh, RNA, single cell RNA-seq, I'm sorry, um, the, the um, spatial transcriptomics data sets. So what, what, what these data sets are, they are, they give you for each, for, for, for pixels on, a, on an image, they, you get a uh, accounts for each gene. So you have space, I have an X, a Y, and then for each X, Y, I have, a pro, I have a profile of gene expression. Now, each one of these pixels isn't necessarily a cell. They, in, in the case of the technology we're, we're working well called, called SmartSeq, you, you can have two cells in, in, a, in a pixel, although it's more common to have one. You sometimes have two. So what, what our collaborators are often interested in are finding genes that have different gene expression across space. Now, the reason that's challenging is that if you just if you just go and find genes that are varying in space, so this is what we did here, just as an example, um, we got a bunch of genes that were uh, just varying in, in space. And what you end up getting when you do that is that you get genes that vary across tissue types or cell types, but the cell types are changing across the space, across space. So here in this case, I have, I'm just showing two, two types of cell neurons. So those are the blue and then the rest. And you can see that, yeah, if you have a gene that is, is expressed in neurons and not the others, then it's gonna look like it's spatially changing because the location of the neurons are obviously spatially changing. So we, so that that was actually some some of the techniques that were out when we started working on this. That's what they they were doing. So we we can't we we developed a method that tries to find spatially changing genes by cell type. So then the first task was to to figure out where what cell type each each one of these pixels were, including the possibility of having more than one. So that's why the that's why it was hard. So I'm gonna skip that and show you what the model looks like for this, those that wanna see more of the mathematics and statistical uh, details. So what's hard here, what made this particularly hard is that you had it's the same model as, 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 as I've been showing before where you assume it's Poisson. You can assume negative. Well, here we don't assume negative binomial, but we have an extra term for variability. Uh, and, but what's a little, this is, What's a little bit complicated about that is that we have a this sum here. These are these are the gene expression profiles, the mu k's that we use the training set to get, and then we have um, mixing proportions beta, because there could be more than one cell type in a pixel. But that sum happens in the it it happens in the original scale because it's, it's biology. Things aren't getting added up in in space. So, so when you take the log for the for the G GLM, this is in the this 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 is inside a log too. So it's not it's not a GLM. So in a GLM there wouldn't be a log here, right? It would just be log of this is the sum of stuff. So that makes it a little bit harder to fit. So part of the challenge here, I'm, and I'm working with a, a student that is is an MIT computer science program. So he is actually better, much better than me at that that part of the project, he can actually fit these things uh, in a pretty uh, efficient way. So I'll just skip to the to the final plot where we find. So what we what we do here now is we, as opposed to the other example where I showed you the gene that was found, sorry the the gene that was found to 
vary across space. Here, here, are the, here, here are two genes that we find to vary across space once you account for cell type. And now you see that it's a little bit, it makes a little bit more sense. So you can see this, this is a, uh, all, all these, all these pixels are probably the same cell type. I think that we did um, ask for it, the probability to be pretty high. And then within that cell type, then you can see it changing across space. Like it's more expressed here and less expressed over there. And this is, this is a second gene with a similar property. All right, so if you wanna read more about this one, oh, I gotta update this. This paper just got accepted in uh, Nature Biotechnology but the title is the same. I need to update this slide. Okay, now I'm sorry, I'm gonna stop, thank you. Great, well, thank you so much. Um, we have about 10 minutes for questions, so I think we'll open that up. Okay. Oh, should I uh, stop sharing or keep it up? Um, I think either can work. Yep, yeah, if you stop sharing, then um, you can, see more of the participants no, as they're asking questions. Okay, let me do that. Yeah, thank Can you. I ask a question? Go right ahead. Okay. Can you briefly compare your method of identifying cell types to Aaron Lund's single R program? Yeah, I think it wasn't it there. I don't know if it's in that table, but it's definitely in our in our in our recent paper. Um I don't know if it was there. That was that's the best one <laughs> that we of, of our competitors. Let me look it up. Let me. Oh, you're not seeing what I'm seeing. Sorry. But first, let me see if it's in this table because if it's not, no. See, this is this is an old table. So sorry, that's not there yet. But it is now. Now we, now we are comparing to it, uh, and it we do we do better in the situations that I described. Uh, but it's, it's, um, that one does work. That I think is the second best one. <laughs> and, and the advantage, the advantage comes from the fact that we're, we're, we're using, a, I think, a probabilistic approach that takes into account the, the, the possibility that things are, are, um, that, that the same, that the, a gene that is on can, can have a different, uh, the genes that are off can have a pretty wide range of values so that when, so the fact that two cells have, have two different values doesn't add to our, dis, our, what the equivalent would be of a distance matrix because they're both off. So, so that's, that's how I think how we improve over, over this other approach. Because they would say, okay, they're different, but we're saying, no, they're not different, they're both off. So we, we remove some of that extra variability that comes from just, you know, just random unwanted vari vari variants. Yeah, so I need to update some of these slides. <laughs> these papers are, cu are currently being uh, improved. Other questions? Hi, can I have to ask a question? I don't know if you saw my hand raised. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, hi, I'm Jonah. I'm a PhD student in the department. Um, so when you're, you're talking a little bit about, um, at least in the first section, about how you can have batch effects when comparing across different samples, I'm wondering, mm -hmm. um, I guess this is gonna be specific to something I'm working on right now, but is there any way you can actually just um, like factor in batch effects when you're trying to compare two groups? Mm -hmm. Say like if you have a differential expression experiment and someone gave you two different data sets that were like processed in different facilities. Mm -hmm. I mean, as like a collaborator, do you just tell them like, I can't work with this because mm -hmm. they're batch effects? No, Maybe. no, not at all, not at all. So, so if, you, if you know, if you think you know the batches and you, you can, a linear model would, would work um, all right. So you just, like, you, add, you add a, a um, you add a factor for a level. For, if you you have a, a factor that explains the, uh, I don't know. You said it was a different experimental batch or whatever it was, and that that has that's a factor. Each one has a level, and you estimate a, an effect for each gene. That is an approach that is uh, has been implemented 
in in the package Lima, for example, for many years, there's a there's something called combat that you that, that uses that idea as well. And it's, it's pretty straightforward. You just you just use linear models to account for for the batches. That is definitely something that we do all the time. Um, the harder part is when you don't know the batches is actually more, more common. So it, it's off, often you don't, you get these batches and, and you really don't have an idea uh, that they were there until after you do some data exploration. Now for that case, there are some methods out there that can be used almost automatically, but not, I always have to do exploration. There's something called singular, um, no, surrogate variable analysis, SVA. And then there's a method that's very similar to SVA called RUV. Uh, and there's more, there's more, more, more people have, there's several other uh, competitors and, and, and innovations to that, to that challenge of what, what do you do when you don't know, when you don't, you don't know the batches, which is, like I said, it's, it's a more common instance. Now, the way you discover them is, is often by using PCA and noticing groupings that aren't supposed to be there is the most common way of, of finding them. But the, the, there's other ways where you just like somehow make a plot that, that where you where you all of a sudden see it. I'll tell you my 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 experience with that that almost got us. We almost went to sent this paper to a to a journal before I discovered that the problem uh, was that was a an, was a, it was a meth, it was DNA methylation, um, and we noticed that the um, the, the, the differences that we were seeing were actually due not to differences in methylation, but differences in cell type composition, which is, is, you can think of that as a batch effect. It's a real biological thing. It's not an experimental anything. It's just the fact that we had different ages and, and, and your immune system changes with age. So the cell type of the people were changing and that's what was causing the differences. Then it turns out there was, a, there was somebody who had published or, or around that time a paper came out um, that was that was pointing that out, but yeah, that's that. Those are the ones that really get you, the ones that you don't know. There's a famous quote right for that, like the knowns that you know and you don't that you don't know. Uh, Rumsfeld, I think, said it. You can look it up. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? I don't know. I, I, I don't. I'm not. I'm gonna look for hands. I don't see any. Yes, please speak up if you have a question. I can maybe ask a question. I have okay. a nice, very nice presentation. Thank uh, you. So it's, it's going to be like a little ill-defined question. I have a sense about what I'm going to ask, but let me try it. So in your first part, you, you, you showed how the proportion of zeros, right, um, kind of drives the, the first principal component. Now, there is more, right, when talking about the proportion of zeros or, or the non-zeros, rather, it's not just that that matters, but also which are the specific, I guess, genes, right? I mean, you can have, like, the same proportion in two cells or a group of cells, let's say, right? But one expresses the, you know, the same number of genes and the other a completely different number of genes. Mm -hmm. um, is there any way to take this into consideration somehow? Yeah, so... Okay, so the way I recommend using this approach is you f first, so, so it's, I don't know, I didn't make this clear enough, but it's not, it's, we don't think of it anymore as it being the proportion of zeros that drives this. It's, it's, the, it's the sample size of the multinomial that drives it, right? So you have every experiment, you grab molecules and every time you grab a different number, the bigger that number, then the probability of zinc and zeros is smaller. Right? So, so there's a direct connection between that sample size and the proportion of zeros, that completely direct. O originally, we noticed it with the zeros, but then later on when we, when we started modeling, it's, it's really that. So, so the, 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 it's not, if, if some genes are, can still be showing up as zero, that's still possible. It's totally possible with a Poisson. Mm -hmm. um, now, when the when it's a big difference in in the in the in that total, that is you you will get that from from our model. You get the offsets that 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 comes out. So you can actually go and look and and check to see if if that 
is is the difference. So if you if you just look at that at the number of, of zeros uh, in each group as a group, mm -hmm. and you think that's interesting, well, that's what you report. The the what's a little bit scary for me about reporting that is because I've seen it so often that it's technical artifacts that drive that. They are, I would be I need a lot of biological support to make that to make it, that conclusion based on data. Mm -hmm. So if your main conclusion is this cell type has more expression than this other cell type, that could be true. And the way it'll show up is that the ends will be different. If you make like a box plot of the ends, you'll see it. But then you have to remember that that we have seen, our experience has shown us that that can actually vary due to other things. But that's what I would say. That was how I would answer that question. It's there, there's a parameter there. I mean, it's not a parameter because you don't, I guess you can call it a parameter, but it's just, you know, it's just a, you just sum them up. You just sum the totals in that and you can then compare them across groups. So it's like separating the two things. It's not that we're saying it can't be differences in total expression. It's just that that's over here. You do that analysis here. And then and then over here, you, you actually look for for um, st structural changes that, that could be due to just how things are expressed differently. Once you, once you account for that. So I hope that answers your question. It's yeah. it's it's yeah, yeah it's a different it's, it's it is a difficult one. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Great. Well, I think we are out of time, and so um, I want to thank you very much for your presentation today, and also um, to all of our seminar participants too. This was of the last seminar of the semester, um, so thank you all for a wonderful oh. semester. <laughs> and hope to see people back in person soon enough <laughs> as we, um, you know, start these seminars back up next year. So thank you. thanks, everyone. Bye, everybody. Thanks for Bye -bye. coming. Thanks.